Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part two in the Franklin Ace 1200 series. In part one, which I recommend you watch first if you haven't seen it already, I fixed the power supply so this computer could work, but I found that the keyboard didn't work at all, and well, I couldn't test anything else. So in this part, I'm gonna fix the keyboard, and we're gonna test out the rest of these parts. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Since this computer is from 1983, the foam and foil pads in the Keytronic keyboard have completely degraded and it's now impossible to type on it. This is very typical and all of these computers are gonna be like it. So to fix it, remove the keyboard from the computer and take the PCB off. You'll see all the degraded foam and foil pads. All of these need to be taken out completely. The foam has degraded and there's a little plastic disc under them that's stuck into the key switch. So what you do is you need to use a little pick or a similar tool and pop each one of those little pads out of there. All traces need to be removed, including the plastic disc that sits underneath the old foam that has completely degraded. Getting it out can be a little fiddly, but I find an O-ring pick seems to do the trick. And as you can see here, they pop out and they kind of go everywhere. So it makes a bit of a mess. So be ready for that. I advise wearing eye protection as well because they can fly right into your eyes. After you get all the little discs out, tilt the keyboard over to get any last remnants out and then clean up your workbench by vacuuming up all the debris. The key to successfully repairing one of these keyboards is to make everything inside the keyboard as clean as possible. The PCB itself ended up with a whole bunch of little bits of foam and dirt and grime from over the years on the PCB and we need to make sure that is completely clean. Also, any oxidation should be removed. I use a little deoxid on a magic eraser to do that, but lots of 99% IPA and gentle rubbing just to make sure the PCB is as clean as possible. If you used deoxid to help remove oxidation like I did, it leaves a film behind and I like to remove that using more 99% IPA afterwards. I don't know if the deoxid will interact with the new foam pads, but I don't wanna risk it. Once you're done, inspect the board. It should be absolutely clean, free of any debris, and looking nice and shiny. Remember that anything left behind on the PCB can cause some keys not to work, so the idea is clean, clean, and more cleaning. We are very lucky in 2023 to have inexpensive foam and foil pads to replace the failed ones. You can pick up bags of 105 from Texelec, and there are some other retailers as well that sell them. I put on gloves for this part because I don't like to get my finger oil onto the new foam and foil pads. This part is probably optional. What I like to do when replacing the foam and foil pads is gently place the new pads into all of the positions on the keyboard. This allows me to go quicker when I'm actually pushing those new pads into the keyboard. Now is the long tedious process of attaching each of the foam and foil pads into the key switches. There are four little prongs on each slider that must be clipped around the plastic disc on the bottom of the pad. And using a flat blade screwdriver helps you clip those pads in properly. It's tedious, but you just have to make sure they're fully attached. Push it in, get all four clips attached, and then make sure the pad is solid in position and doesn't move when you rub on it. This is what I'm doing here. And then you just go through and repeat that process for every single slider and key switch on the entire keyboard. It is absolutely imperative you have every plastic disc fully inserted into each slider. All four of the prongs need to be clipped around that plastic disc. If you miss one of the prongs, the entire pad is offset and that's gonna cause problems. In fact, what I do is I go through the entire keyboard once, make sure I've clipped everything on, and then I actually go through it all over again and double check that everything is still clipped. On this keyboard, I actually found that there were about three or four sliders where I had left one of the four prongs unclipped from the disc. So I found those and I got those clipped on. As I mentioned, this process is long and tedious. So put on some music or a podcast and just be methodical about it. 
And I'm all done. So a final clean with some compressed air just to make sure nothing is left on the keyboard. And now just a quick dusting of the PCB and it's time to reassemble the keyboard. When reinstalling the screws, I recommend turning the screw backwards first until you hear it click and then turn forward. That way you're not creating new threads inside the fragile old plastic. Don't over tighten these screws. They just need to hold the PCB in place. And we're done. I just push on every single key, make sure nothing is binding, nothing sounds weird or makes squeaky noises, and we're ready for testing. And would you look at that? The keyboard is absolutely working. I tested this keyboard and every single key works perfectly. I recommend pushing each key a couple times, make sure you don't have any repeats or missed key presses. And luckily, on this Franklin Ace 1000, every single thing works and I am happy. Now the keyboard works, it's time to look at the disk drives and the associated disk controller that came with the machine. I have a feeling these things are probably going to work. These drives might just need some head cleaning and maybe a little bit of lubrication. So I'm going to pop these off of the machine here, which, wow, it's heavy. I forget about that. And let's figure out how to remove the drives from here so I can give them a little bit of a clean and an inspection. All right, let's get this heavy disk drive module on the bench and figure out how to get the drives out. It looks pretty easy. I really need to get a wider angle lens on the camera up here because as you can see, I can't really fit this entire thing into the view. But if we move these cables out of the way and slide this over a little bit, looks like if we take out these screws around the perimeter here, this metal plate comes out. I think the, the disk drives are attached to it because we could see that there are four screws here attaching the drive. Uh, there are three screws on one side and three screws on this side, and I think this thing should come right out. All right, with the screws out, I think the easiest way to get this out, because the drives are really heavy, is just to flip this over and get it down onto the bench. And yes, indeed, there came the uh, top cover, and the drives are still on the bench. Now, I gotta say, this thing seems really quite well made. The top cover is, like, filled with metal and structural reinforcements and whatever. And in fact, look at these drives here. They have entire cases around them, which is really odd. Why would it even need that? It's inside of that entire enclosure. Why does it need this extra enclosure on the top? Right? Like anyhow, to release the drives, I just have to take the four screws off the, the bottom here and then those drives should come away. Now there's actually a good chance that these drives totally work fine um, as it is. Like I don't need to do any of this service. But I do like to just take a look inside of these. Uh, and the fact that there's a musty smell around the whole computer means there might be a little bit of mold or whatever inside the drives, especially on those drive rails. And just a little lubrication can help prolong the life of the drives. There it is. Now, if I slide these forwards, uh, there is some double-sided tape here that kind of holds these um, wires on. And I should be able to get these cables off of here. Yep, they do come off the drive. If I pull that out, there's a... There's a connector inside there on that one and on this one, same thing. So I can pull that off. Now I talked about this in the first video. Now it's unusual to me that these two drives are completely different models. Uh, we can see here, this is a Sugar Associates SA390, which is the SA400 drive minus the PC or Sugar interface board on the top. And this will be replaced with an Apple II style one. And then the other drive here is an MPIO drive. So yeah, not even the same. But if we look at the bottom plate, there are two serial numbers, 186345 and 186340, which I assume are the serial numbers for the, the, the drives from uh, Franklin here. And they're only five apart, and yet they're completely different drive manufacturers. That just seems a little unusual to me. But anyhow, whatever, it shouldn't make a difference. And from an outward appearance, they both look identical. So first, let's start with the Sugar SA390. So this uh, is very clean on the inside. Um, I'm going to give this belt a little bit of a clean, but luckily it's in good shape. The way I clean belts on disk drives like this is I use Windex. I don't use alcohol on these because, I, you know, I don't know if it matters, but I've always heard that the alcohol can kind of uh, cause the rubber to dry out. So I just basically take a little bit of a paper towel with some Windex, and then I run the belt through it like this just sort of cleans off any dust and gunk that's on it. And there's the paper towel, and you can see a little bit of the brown um, gunk came off there. And let's just clean this pulley while we're at it here. So I'm just gonna touch the uh, part where the belt isn't on and give it a spin, cleaning the belt and the dirt on it. 
can help the motor give uh, a little bit more torque to the spindle to turn the disc. So if you find that you have a disc drive when you put a disc in there, it doesn't seem to spin. There we go, that cleaned off the spindle a little bit. It doesn't seem to spin the floppy disc. It could just be because the belt is dirty, needs a little bit of a clean like I just did there. If that's not working, I don't even know where you can find replacement belts or maybe sellers for specific drives like this SA390 and SA400. They're common drives that were used on a lot of machines. But this other MPIO drive that I took off here has a different size belt and there's a good chance you can never find a good one. So be careful, don't break these belts. Um, luckily they're fabric reinforced, but a little clean can go a long way. And of course, if it's not gripping, maybe take a little bit of sandpaper and just try to rough up the, the texture a little bit to let it grip these spindles a little bit better. But I find that typically cleaning them, and if we just carefully pull this off, there is the belt. And um, you can see it's sort of fabric reinforced looking on one side. I don't really know if it is fabric reinforced, but I'm just gonna be very careful with it when cleaning. I don't wanna break this because that would render this drive inoperative. Alrighty, that seems pretty good for the belt. So I'm just gonna clean this spindle here. This is the motor. A little bit, little bit came off there. Spindle. It's not turning super great. Uh, the drive is closed, so if I open the drive. So it's not great, but it's not terrible either. I've had drives that are a lot worse than this. If the spindle doesn't spin freely at all, it's very gummed up. What I found you can do is take something like a Dremel, put um, a bit on there that's rubber, and you run the Dremel and push it up against this to really spin it, and it frees up that bearing by just running it. I suppose running the drive might have the same effect, but as a computer, it may not run the drive for more than a few seconds at a time. That would just take a very long time. So the Dremel just allows this to spin freely and can free up the bearing. I've had good luck with that. I don't think it's very permanent, but it can help in the short term. This seems to be okay though. It's not moving, there's not a lot of run out. So I'm gonna say on the bottom of this drive, things are looking good. I'm just gonna pop this belt back on. The way you do it, it's just like that. Just don't stretch it or pull it too tightly or it might break. There's the inside. So this is the controller. Looks like Franklin made their own. So they bought the SA390 and then they uh, designed this board and that talks to the, the motors and the head and stuff like that. Strangely enough, there's a post-it note inside of here. Um, doesn't have anything written on it, just a little piece of tape. So that's odd. I am noticing there is a serial number sticker inside. Let's see if I can zoom up and we can see that. Looks like 175567, so it doesn't match the serial number on the bottom of the plate. So maybe this was a replacement, which is why these true drives do not match, uh, at least from a manufacturing standpoint. Now talking about the SA390, it's interesting because the original Apple II disk drives, the ones that Steve Wozniak designed, it was the same thing. They, um, well, Apple bought the SA390 mechanism sugar art, so missing that top controller board, and then Woz designed his own board to go on the top that would talk to the Apple II. Now, as I mentioned, this interface card here is not a clone of the Apple II, but it uses the same exact signaling and it works exactly the same way as the Apple II Disc II controller. And so does this top controller. This is gonna be Franklin's own design, it even says Franklin Computer right there, but it's going to be a clone again of the Apple II Disc controller. And you could plug this drive through this interface cable right into an Apple II or an Apple II Disc controller and it will work. The final thing I wanna do is just take this PCB off here. We're gonna take a look at the mechanism underneath, make sure that that head is able to move freely. Now we pop this off, there's two screws. We just connect the read write head there, and then we can just slide this forward to get it off. And there is the inside of the drive. There's a little bit of dirt and stuff here, but that's not a big deal. Now the way these move the head is different than the way it works on later disk drives. Those have a single stepper motor that's sideways with sort of a pinion system, which is able to move the head back and forth. The, the stepper is mounted this way, but the stepper on this drive, if we flip it over, is this motor right here and it's mounted with the shaft facing up. And that turns this little turntable thing here, which has a groove in it, and that allows the head to move. Now it is moving nice and smoothly, so I'm not seeing any issues. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put a little bit of lubricant on this slider right here, the one that runs along next to the head, just to make sure that it's gonna move nice and smoothly. I have this little drip bottle here. It's with bearing oil in it. I don't even know the brand. I, I have a big bottle of it I use for my air conditioning. And this is typically, oh, air conditioning, for the motors in my air handler for my AC system. And this is typically what I'll do. I'll just put one drop on the shaft there and then we just move the head through its normal movement. And that just sort of moves it around on that front part. We do the same over here, one drop, that's all it takes. And that is it. 
Now it's nice and smooth and it's working well. This one here doesn't need to be lubricated really, it's just plastic that runs on this. I think there's a metal bearing on that part right there. Now when working on these types of drives, I don't recommend taking off any of the stuff around the head assembly. I would just leave that as is, just lubricate any sliders and you might wanna clean the read right head, which if we zoom up here, there it is. It's that white part underneath this part. Now this is what applies pressure to the disc when the disc is in and the mechanism is clamped when you close the front lever like this. It lowers that down and that pushes on the disc to give the right pressure so the read write head can actually read and write the data. If this is misaligned or, or the spring tension is wrong on this, you can have a lot of trouble. So when you move this by hand, don't ever move it more than just a little bit because if you spring it up too much, you can damage it and then it won't be pushing down the disc with the proper force and then the disc won't be working. For cleaning the read right head, cleaning disc works well, or you can use 99% isopropyl alcohol, and I have these little flat, kind of like a cotton swab thing, but it's a flat version, and a viewer sent these in, and I think they're designed for cleaning like read right heads or tape heads and stuff like that. So I just put a little bit of the IPA on there, flip this up, and then the nice thing about these flat things is if I just, it's hard to do this while filming, raise this up a little bit just to make clearance, and then I could just, uh, get in there with this flat thing. I don't want to touch the pad that's on the top. Just want to rub this, make sure it's nice and clean. But honestly, nothing's really coming off on this. So I think that the read right head is already in really good shape on this disc drive. So I am thinking that there's absolutely nothing wrong with this drive. The last thing I want to do is adjust this thing right here, which is the latch mechanism. It kind of slides in and out of here. There's a little bit of a track here and I like it to, to be able to slide as smoothly as possible. They can get kind of gummed up, and as the drive gets really dirty, it can become really hard to move, and I think, you know, it could risk breaking this. So a little bit of lubricant there is all that's needed to make this move smoothly again. What I like to use in those sliders is a little silicone lubricant or a little silicone grease. In this case, I have some, uh, I have some lubricant normally in this little squeezy bottle here, but it seems like it's all out, so I'll use this in the meantime. So I'll just squeeze a little bit onto a cotton bud here. That's all it takes. And then I'll just sort of goop some in there just a little bit, wipe off any excess, do it on both sides, put it through its paces a few times. And yeah, that made a huge difference. The, the latch mechanism now is so much smoother and uh, works so much better now. Okay, so this one is back together roughly. I'm not gonna put the top cover on. I'm gonna work on the other drive now. It should be basically identical to this, except um, actually, no, the other one appears to have a stepper motor on the bottom, just like the Sugar. So I think this one, the second drive, has a, one of those turntable slider mechanisms that works just like this. So anyways, I'm gonna work on that exactly the same way, and then we're gonna test them out. Hmm, okay, I wasn't gonna show working on this other drive. Now, when I took the cover off of the belt, um, it was on normally, but I have to say this belt is actually stuck onto the spindle. Now it's not stuck badly, but as you can see, it is stuck. So some cleaning, some good cleaning is gonna be necessary and possibly, ah yes, look at that spindle. Oh, okay, it's also very stiff and hard to turn. Let's um, open the mechanism. Oh yeah, it's still pretty hard to turn. The spindle on the motor here, that is fine. But this one, and this bearing is not in good shape. I mean, look, doesn't spin that well either. I may need to get the Dremel out and do that trick. First, I'm gonna to try to clean this corrosion off and let's see if that does work or if I need to use the Scotch-Brite. Oh yeah, I think I'm gonna to have to use Scotch-Brite. Hopefully you can see what I'm talking about there with the corrosion. Yeah, not great. Here's some green Scotch-Brite. Uh, I like the brown stuff, it's a little more abrasive, but this does work okay. So I'm just gonna give this a little bit of a spin while holding the Scotch-Brite against it. Maybe I'll flip this around so you can see what I'm doing. All right, I'm using my index finger and my thumb to hold the Scotch-Brite against the spindle, and then I'm using my other hand's index finger or uh, fingers and thumb to turn it. So I'm able to apply a good amount of pressure to it. And I think it's having an effect. It's not gonna make it perfectly clean. I need to have something a little bit more aggressive, but I don't think it necessarily really matters. Definitely some um, junk came off there on the Scotch-Brite. Well, I gotta say, it still has a little bit of uh, gunk on there, but it's smooth, totally smooth to the touch now. I mean, there's a little bit of a bump going on there, but I think that's a huge improvement to what it was like. So now I'm just gonna hold the Windex on it 
I'll give it a clean because of of course the scotch bright is going to leave behind some metal residue and yes it is see it's a little black there with all of the metal residue coming off so the belt which is clean and dry now put this back on there we go well what i'm going to do is we'll test this when the computer is hooked up and see if it's able to read discs if not then we're going to have to do that dremel trick to try to loosen this bearing up a little bit so we can see here looking to the top of the drive that the serial number matches what was on that metal plate so this is one of the original drives from the computer and the sugar one was obviously swapped out at some point and with an older drive ah okay so we have a metal plate covering things up making it a little harder for us to see all right so looking at the head assembly it does not use that turntable-y spinny thing and it is totally frozen there's no way this drive would have worked I should be able to turn this by hand and move the head and um, that is not moving at all so that's not good. It's funny. I wonder what happened to this machine. Oh, wow. Um, sometimes all it takes is just to kind of turn this and free it up and get the head moving, but I don't know. Oh, there we go. Wow, it's really tough. Oh, so can I get this plate off here so we can all see what's going on? There we go. That was a little tough to get off. With that off, you can see that I can just barely move the head here. Now, I don't know what's stuck. I don't know if it's the motor that's binding up or if it's the actual slider head assembly here. So we'll start with adding some of this bearing lubricant to the sliders here. Just one drop, one there and one there. And we'll just try to get it to kind of get underneath there. I'm able to move it that much, but then it really binds up when it goes any further. I think it's getting better. There's really no way this would have worked. <laughs> if the computer were trying to move this, that head would have just like made a buzzing sound and not gone anywhere at all. But sometimes all it takes is just moving it back and forth like this. And you do it enough times and it kind of just starts working a lot better. Now, right down there, that is the top of the stepper motor. And what I'm gonna try to do is drip some of this bearing oil down underneath that wheel i guess you can call it there and try to get it onto the shaft of the stepper motor if we flip the drive over looks like the uh, shaft is exposed as well so i'm going to drip some oil into there as well i think i think this problem that it's having is not the sliders where the uh, head moves which we can incidentally we can see that on the underside here as well i think the problem is the stepper motor itself has just frozen up so this can be a little bit of a tough problem here because ultimately the bearings inside these types of motors are sealed and putting oil in them really shouldn't do anything anyways and they shouldn't have frozen up over time but if this were stored in properly hot and cold weather kind of thing and really you have to take apart the stepper motor and press the old bearings out and put new ones in it's probably serviceable if you have a machine shop and you're really good at that stuff it's just not something a regular hobbyist can do not unless you can find a replacement motor so i put some oil in the bottom there and i'm going to try to do the same on the top here so usually just tilt it over to the side try to get this in just put a few drops in there and now i'm just going to try to exercise it yeah this really might be a lost cause i don't think this is going to get any better it's really hard to move through parts of the motion parts of it are okay like it moves all right but right there i can barely turn it with my fingers well i take that back it it it, is, it seems to be freeing up a little bit it's still very, very stiff, but at least it's stiff the same amount. Now, I'm moving it by the head, and you probably shouldn't do that uh, because it can put a lot of stress on the head assembly, which is mostly plastic, so it could break. But I'm being careful not to exert too much pressure on it. It feels consistent, at least now. It's moving through the entire motion. It's stiff, but it's consistently stiff. It's not like it's really stiff in some parts and freeze up in others. And maybe the way this, this particular stepper motor works, I mean, the drive is not energized, but maybe the way this works is it's just hard to turn. I've never found a floppy drive that's like this, but it could be the case. So really at this point, I think I just need to get this drive hooked up to the computer and see what happens. We, just, we need to see if that head is jammed up or moves freely. Other things I need to do, let's see, I'm gonna clean the heads and I'm gonna lubricate the uh, latch mechanism like I did on the other one. 
All right, the Franklin's on the bench. I have the Sugar Drive connected to a different disc controller just to kind of rule out any issues. And I have a working disc drive connected up here. You can't really see it, but there it is. It's one I use for testing on, on all Apple IIs. I have the software called Locksmith in the working drive. And let's turn on the computer here. And there it is, it booted up. Now this has a useful utility called 16 sector fast verify. And I'm gonna do that. And we do input drive one, which is the working drive here, and we hit space. This is the way it should look when you have a working disc. Okay, and there's a two there. That meant that it had a little bit of trouble reading that one sector, but that's not really a problem on Apple IIs. Now, if we take this disc and we stick it in the other drive here, and we go back to here and we change it to drive two, and there we go. It's reading the disc perfectly. Now, what I'm gonna do is I wanna format a blank disc right here in this drive, so escape out of that. So I'm gonna put a blank disk in here, and I'm gonna go back to you, and we're gonna do 16 sector format, and we're gonna do drive two. And what I wanna do is make sure that when I format this disk in this drive here, that we're then able to move it into this other drive and read it properly. Now, I don't think this format is actually working properly because I think it should have the letter F above each track number, and it has those asterisks. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go and erase disk first, which, there we go, which I think is sort of like a bulk erase. Yeah, it's just erasing the disk and then you can lay down that 16 sector format. The way the Apple II disks work is very different than MFM drives because of the simplicity of the system and the efficiency of the system that I think kind of requires those two steps. So now we go back to here and we're gonna do format, and we're gonna do drive two, all the tracks, and hit space. And no I, no, I don't think this is actually working. Now let's think about what's going on here. It was able to read this already formatted disk, no problem. But yet, it doesn't seem to be able to format a disk. So I'm having, I'm thinking that maybe in the circuitry on the board, there's like a write amplifier that takes the signal that comes from the computer over the ribbon cable here and then amplifies it so it can go to the read write head and it needs to energize the erase head and then write at the same time. And if that part of the circuitry is not working, then that could be one explanation why it's not able to format the disk properly. And yet, you know, reading a disk is okay, but writing to a disk might be a problem. Now, one thing I actually did to this drive before I plugged it in, and I didn't show this, is I uh, used my chip lifter tool here, this one, and I lifted every IC off the board and just reseated it, just to make sure there was no bad connections or anything like that. And right now I'm just touching each one of them, just making sure nothing is unusually hot, like that, or weird. Okay, so that finished, it's all asterisks. I think that's a problem. If we go to the utilities here and we do verify again, we do disk drive two. Um, all right, so interesting is it did just read this disk, but I, I last used this testing with this disk here, this blank disk on an Apple II. And what we're seeing here was just what was on the disk before when I was last using it. We can tell if we flip this over, I'm just gonna use my disk puncher thing here to punch a hole in the side of the disk. Let's flip this disk over Let's try to erase this in this drive. Well, first we'll verify it. Oops. We'll verify it, make sure that it's got nothing on it at all. So there we go. Okay, so this is probably, I, the last time I used this disc was in an Apple II on the first side, but the second side was probably used on a PC or whatever. So it's not able to read the MFM format. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna format this disc again on the back side here. And I bet you when we go to read the disc, it's gonna read it exactly like we just saw with all A's which implies that it's the right capability of this drive is no longer functional. So I just did the erase and let's just do the format for 16 sectors. And we'll go through all that and we'll hit the button on there. Let's see if this works. I mean, the fact that it's giving all Fs does imply that it's actually working. So what was going on with that other one? Okay, it worked, I guess. Uh, verify, drive two. Okay, so this was a blank disk that had never been used and is now reading it back properly. Let's switch this over to the other drive and let's see what happens here. Hey, 
So why a second ago did it not erase the disk properly when it seems to be working? I don't, I don't, I am confused here. This other side here, let's verify the front side. So this is the front side that we read a second ago. Yeah, and remember how it started with A's and it had a bunch of weird numbers um, throughout it? Well, on the working drive, this is good. Okay, let's switch this over to this drive. This is the, this is the front side of the floppy disk here, UV2. I mean, okay, there's a couple ones there. There's a few little things here and there, but it's magically working. I'm very confused. What is going on exactly? The only thing I can think of is that maybe there's a disk speed problem in the sugar drive. Check out the disk speed. So we go disk speed. We're going to do optimum. We're going to do drive two. It does destroy uh, the stuff that's on there. Course adjustment, samples per line. There we go. So this should show us a little bit. Okay, so there's the disk speed. So it should be as close to that middle line as possible. So I'm gonna slow it down a little bit. I'm just gonna turn that potentiometer on the speed control board. Now we're adjusting the course adjustment here, which means um, you just try to get to the middle and then we'll go to one of those finer adjustments. There we go, like that. And we're gonna escape out of here and we're gonna go back to speed again. We're gonna do optimum. We're gonna be output drive two. We're gonna do, I don't know, I'll do a fine adjustment, three samples per line, and let's see how far off this is. We're just gonna to try to get it again as close as we can to that middle line. It's already pretty close, it's pretty dialed in. Slow it down just a little bit. Obviously the speed, oh, it's very, very sensitive. The speed obviously fluctuates slightly on this disc because it's three samples per line, but that's good enough. Let's escape out of here and let's see if we do the verify, if it looks any better now, if that last track, because the first track we could ignore, that was the speed test. Um, I think it erases that first track. Do we have any numbers on that last track? Oh, we still got a couple little numbers. Okay, the only thing I can think of at this point is that the differential amplifier control right here may need just the slightest tweak. So I'm gonna turn it slightly and we're gonna let this go. Let's see if that helps. This adjusts the uh, read-write differential amplifier on the drive. No, it didn't change it at all. Could be this disc is bad as well, or just marginally bad. Usually when you have like a couple ones or twos, it's not the end of the world. Like it's still gonna read Apple II discs pretty much without an issue. You still would rather see the whole screen filled with just periods. Look at that, that worked. So I did, I just adjusted that ever so slightly. So I think this drive is functional. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna turn this off. I'm gonna pull this, this controller out of here, this known good one, and I'm gonna swap over to the, the one that's from the computer, this one right here. And I'll plug this sugar drive here into drive one. And we're gonna try to boot this system into Locksmith using that controller. Let's see if it works. Okay, there's Locksmith. Let's pop this in. Let's get this disc out of here. Put the locksmith in and we'll turn that there. Yeah, it's freaking working. So you verify, let's verify this disc. All right, all right, so this drive's good. This controller is obviously working. The drive is working. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now the question is, how about this other drive? Is this thing going to work? I borrowed this ribbon cable here off that other half height drive, the working drive. Let's just plug this into the controller. Make sure I have it on the right way, I do. All right, and let's plug this in. Do you have to make sure you have the in the right way so that there's a one on the board right there and of course the red stripe. I'll swap these drives around since the working one, I can put it off frame. And you really can't see much here, can you? I'm gonna move this stuff around a little bit so you can see better. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we boot this computer up. Um, make sure this is all correct. Yep, this is good. Here we go. And we are in locksmith. Okay, so let's put that blank disc. Where is the blank disc? Here it is. This is the one that we formatted. Let's put it in the drive here, the one that I think is not gonna work. Let's see if this thing works. So we're gonna go U, V, two. Oops, that was the wrong button. 
UV2. No. It's also spinning super slowly. Check this out. I'm gonna hit spacebar. Watch how slowly it's spinning. That is not fast enough. Not even a little bit fast enough. And there it is. If I take the disc out, let's see what happens if we hit spacebar now. It's spinning a little bit faster. You can see that's not quite right. Okay, so I adjusted the speed potentiometer. I couldn't really do it while showing you uh, what I was doing, but I've noticed there's some other issues. Let me try to hold this drive so I don't short anything out. So we can see the read right head there. And watch when I start this, the disc verify. See, it moves. So it is moving, but it gets stuck. There it is, it's stuck right there. Now if I give it a little push, now it stopped. Let me give it a little push. We can get through that hard spot. So there we go, I moved it all the way to the extreme when we start it. It's kind of able to move back through that tough spot, but there's a spot where it's just really sticky and not moving. Notice the disc speed though, it's a lot better than it was. So I think this thing might be able to read like the first few tracks of the disc at this point. Let's see what happens if I put the disc in. And we try this again. No. I think what's happened is with the disc in there, it has slowed down and it has indeed. There we go. So watch this. I started again. Look at how slow it's spinning. But if I open the latch, see it speeds up. It's still not going at the right speed. I think the bearing is just toast in there. I'm, I think I'm going to hook this drive up to the first connector on here. And what that does is when we boot this thing up, if we take, take the power off here and we unplug this and I plug this drive into the first connector, it's just going to spin that motor indefinitely because it can't read that disc, right? So we turn that on. And it's just gonna sit there and spin it forever. So we'll just let that spin and kind of loose, hopefully loosen up that bearing. And then maybe that'll, maybe that'll make it work. Well, you won't even believe it. What we're looking at here is the drive speed, the fine drive speed adjustment of this MPI drive, the one that basically wasn't working at all. I let it run for a long time and the drive speed just seemed to kind of get faster and faster and faster. And that's with a floppy disk in there. So I reconfigured the drives where the MPI drive here is drive number two again. Drive number one is the, uh, the sugar drive that was fixed earlier. And I booted back into locksmith and here we are on the fine adjustment and the speed, it kind of fluctuates around as you can see, in fact, I haven't touched anything. Well, I put my hand near the drive, I guess, but the drive speed was a little bit faster and it seems to have slowed down. But even more than that, let's exit out of this and I'm gonna flip this disc over and put it back to the side of the disc that's freshly formatted. And let's do UV drive two. That's this drive. <laughs> and look at that. It's actually reading the whole disc. I can't even believe it. It's freaking working. So I have to say um, in between now and when I stopped recording, I did fiddle around with the drive a little bit. So once the drive speed started working, I would do this verify and it would kind of go through most of the disc and then it would stop where the head was sort of getting stuck in the stepper motor. Well, I just did this over and over again. I just kept redoing it and I would flip the drive over and I would just force the head past that stiff part. And then it just, after a couple times of doing that, it's freaking working. So this was a disc that was formatted, actually it was formatted in this drive, I think. But even if I take this disc out, so let's remove this blank disc and we'll, uh, we'll put in the locksmith disc, the locksmith disc here. So this is one that was made on a different disc drive and it works, although Notice it has a couple, I don't know, bad sectors or whatever. I'm gonna put this disc back into the sugar drive here, into drive uh, one, and let's go check that because I wanna make sure, input drive one. So that is the sugar SA390. And okay, look. So it seems like this disc just has some bad sectors on it now. Now that might've been, something I did, um, turning this machine off and on. The disc is right protected, so it wasn't like it got written to. But we do know that those two bad sectors show up on 
both of these drives. Um, let's try the other side of this disc. It says Apple II Desktop. Could be that this floppy disk is just going bad. It's what happens. Uh, we're gonna escape out of there. UV2. And let's see if it reads this properly. I mean, I just, I can't even believe it. I can't believe it. I, I was completely sure that this MPI drive would never work properly. I mean, the bearings seemed all sticky and messed up. And yet, it's, it's a search that I, I can't even believe it, that it's, it's working. So at this point, both of these drives appear to work. And the only thing I had to do on the Sugar drive, that's uh, this one right here, was we adjusted the speed a little bit and I turned the differential amplifier control just ever so slightly. And that seemed to make it read disks a little bit more reliably. On the MPI drive, I didn't even touch that potentiometer there. And incidentally, I'm looking at these two boards. They are the same. These two controller boards are almost identical. It's funny, I didn't even notice that. There's just some slight differences with the way the connector is that goes to the electronics, but it seems that Sugar designed that board in a way that could work with multiple different drive types. Anyhow, I'm amazed. Okay, so I adjusted the speed a few times on the MPI drive, but I never touched a differential amplifier. I didn't reseat the chips on the MPI drive. It's just working because I figured people are gonna wanna see this. If I flip this over and we look at the um, sticker here. So look at that. We know the speed is good. Now the question is, it's hard to hold this drive. If I take the disc out, is the drive speed gonna change dramatically? Because earlier on when there was a lot of drag on it, I could get this adjusted correctly for the most part by turning that potentiometer. But then if I opened the, the clamp for the disc, the spindle would speed up a lot. So we're gonna start this again. And no, without the disc, the speed of the spindle is still running at the same speed. That means that the drag on the overall system has basically gone away. So there we go. At this point, both of these drives work. I'm not sure of the long-term reliability of this MPI drive, just because I feel like those bearings might freeze up again. But the Sugar drive didn't really have a problem with that issue. So I think that that drive is gonna be reliable. So I'm gonna make the Sugar drive drive one, which actually matches what is on the drive. There's a metal badge right here that says one. Uh, so that is how it was already configured. So I'm gonna make that drive one because it's the more likely drive to work in the long term. And then this will be the second drive. And let me put it back together. There it is, it's back together. The two drives are in here and it's looking good. Let's see if it still all works though. We know this machine runs locksmith, but how about we run some diagnostics? This is Apple II Cillin. Let's just stick this in the drive and see if uh, it boots and works and I can run some diagnostics. Well, let's power this up. Definitely drive one, which is the Sugar drive is the one that's uh, booting, so to speak. And there it is, Apple Cillin. Now I think this particular diagnostic was designed for the Apple II Plus, but that's fine because that's what this is. So let's do a RAM test and we'll do motherboard RAM low, which I think is the first 16K of memory. And this goes pretty quickly. Now test through the video memory. We saw a little bit of static on the screen there, totally normal. And yeah, it's already looping, so that's working. And if we go back to RAM test and we do the high memory, it's the other 32K of memory, which is a total of 48K S to start. And it should go up through B, F, F, F without any errors. Now, the fact is this computer has been working. So I doubt there are any problems with the memory on this machine, which is kind of amazing. This computer, besides the power supply, and the keyboard, of course, and the floppy drives also needing service, all of the electronics in here are actually working perfectly. It's sort of mechanical failures other than the reefa cap that failed. And it's already looped through, and so that is working. I think we go to RAM test and we do memory cards. Let's do memory cards, slot number zero. Hopefully zero will test the extra 16K of memory, which is a total of 64K on this computer. And yes, it's working, cool. So it's testing the extra memory that's on that card and it's, yeah, it looped through, so it's working. And of course, it's not a physical card on this computer. It's built into the motherboard, just like it is on the Apple IIe. But as far as software knows, it thinks it's in slot zero, like one of those Apple memory cards or those Microsoft extra memory cards. Cool, 
let's try ROM memory. I mean, that's gonna fail, right? Because it's gonna think that this is actually an Apple II Plus. So it's gonna have different checksums on those ROMs, but let's see what it says. Thinks it's working and detects it as an Applesoft ROM, <laughs> even though it's, it's a fake ROM. And these are showing up as unknown, of course, because there are changes in these in the ROMs on this thing so that they're not totally a copy of Apple's ROMs. Although, yeah, okay, so three of them are unknown and three of them show up as the regular AppleSoft ROM. <laughs> there is a disk two system check. Let's go look at what this is. Sequential read, sequential write. Let's do a random read test on the second disk drive which should exercise the actual mechanism. We know that read write head is kind of flaky, right? So let's do, put the disc in drive two. We're gonna hit K, slot number six. Okay, drive number two, oops, drive number two. And we're gonna hit S to start. It sounds like it's working. And the good thing about this test is it's really exercising this and it would be nice if this thing just ran indefinitely because I could just let this thing sit here and run this test forever. Well, not forever, but you know, say like for an hour and it will really give that head a workout to make sure that that, that sticky spot is worked out entirely. And yeah, it seems to be just going indefinitely. My thought is that since it did the head bang when it initially started up, that sets the track zero since there's no track zero sensor on these drives. So if ever it went to go read a track and the head got stuck and it read the wrong track, it would show up as an error on this test. I'm just gonna let this run for, I don't know, 10 minutes and we'll come back and make sure that it looks good. Well, it finished and actually what it did is it read all the tracks, which I guess there are 34 or 35 on an Apple II disc and it randomly seeked to all of those tracks and it did it 16 times because it read one sector at a time. So it kept randomly seeking around and reading a single sector until it read every single sector on the disk and it freaking works. So this disk drive really does work properly. Back at the main menu, let's see what else there is in here. So we have peripheral cards, keyboard. Now keyboard's not really gonna work very well for us because this keyboard has extra keys on it. So you can push keys, but if I push like the caps lock key, it's gonna be unhappy because it just got a lowercase key, which it totally does not expect since the Apple II Plus doesn't support a lowercase. I'm gonna hit reset, that should exit out of there. Let's take a look at the CRT test. Should give us some color bars and stuff. Let's look at one color bar pattern. So we're in monochrome mode. Let me get the remote for the retro tank and let's switch this over to composite and it looks absolutely terrible. Now I'm wondering if it's because I don't have the potentiometer adjusted correctly for the video level. The only way to properly test the video level output on an Apple II by adjusting that potentiometer is to hook up an oscilloscope while there's a monitor or some other load connected to it. And of course that means I need to take the disc drives off and tilt them over on their side. Hopefully that works. Okay, there we go. I propped something under it. So it's hopefully staying up. Got to grab my oscilloscope probe here. Let's connect this up to the video signal. We can do it on the inside of the computer. All right, so here is the video signal. I'm going to bring the cursors down. Now remember the Apple II is a monochrome de device, so it can only output a couple things. This is a sync pulse right here. There's the color burst. And then this is black of the border area. And then this is the information in the picture. And there's obviously a white part here. And that's as high as you can get. And then this is the border. And then we have a sync pulse again. If we look here at the Delta Y, 763 millivolts is not enough. We need to turn this up. So with this started, I'm gonna grab a little adjustment tool and I'm going to adjust this potentiometer till it comes up. So let's see how that looks. And there we go. We are at 1.03 volts from this lowest point to the highest point. And if you're unsure, Wikipedia has a good article on IRE, which is the setup level for the video signal. And right down here at the bottom of the sync pulse, we should see 0.00 volts. Now, of course, it's dropping a little bit negative on the oscilloscope, but that's that's no problem because the monitor will, will take care of that. And then full brightness is right up here at, well, plus 1.07 volts. So I suppose I could turn it up just ever so slightly so it gets up to that. And there we go, I have a 1.05. That is close enough. I'm not gonna bother fiddling with that any further. Now switching back to full screen, it looks pretty terrible. I'm gonna turn the retro tink off and on. Maybe that'll make a bit, a bit better of a video signal. To be honest, I haven't really used this new retro tink very much with Apple IIs. And now we have no color altogether. Oh, let's go back to composite. Now, 
gosh, that looks absolutely terrible. So the question is, is the video output from this computer terrible or is the RetroTINK the problem not decoding the artifact color properly? To know for sure, I have the little Sony Color TV, the one that's been RGB modded, hooked up. And uh, yeah, that looks pretty terrible here as well. Now we have to remember that the color generation on the Franklin is different than the way the Apple II does it because they got sued by Apple and they lost. So they had to come up with a little workaround board that would allow them to, well, not be patent infringing. And this could be one of the reasons why it looks not so great. Now it seems one workaround for this is just simply to turn the color down in your TV or monitor and that would make it look a little less garish and terrible. And that's probably what they recommended you do back in the day hook when you had a monitor hooked up to this thing. Luckily in the retro tank, there is actually a way to turn the chroma down in the menu. It's not really do it. Oh yeah, it's working. All right. But even after tweaking the yellow, it's pretty terrible. All the colors look pretty bad, at least in double high res. Hopefully if we look at the high res colors like violet and orange, green, those all look absolutely fine and blue. So those would be the colors of normal Apple II games. Enough diagnostics. Let's try out a couple games on this thing because this is fully Apple II compatible. So we have the game Droll by Broderbund. We have to power cycle this computer since there's no open Apple control reset equivalent on this thing. Since it's fully Apple II Plus compatible and it has 64K, all these different games that work on an Apple II Plus with 64K should work properly on this machine. So Droll, pretty fun game. There's a Commodore 64 version as well. Not sure what other platforms it made its way onto, but there it is. Looks not great. The color is a little oversaturated, like I said, and the brightness is a little too low. But let's see, this should work. I forgot how to, what are the controls? There we go, it's A, Z, and the up and down arrow. The whole idea is we're trying to, uh, I don't know what the little girl does. Do we shoot the balloon? Hi, whoa, I need to get this guy. No, I need to get, I forgot. There's a little guy, a little like crocodile, I guess it looks like, or alligator with a rocket pack on its back. That's what you need to pick up to finish the level. And you gotta avoid these uh, scorpion things, shoot them. Oh, that's what, that's what we were looking for to end the level. So game is working perfectly though. Sound, graphics, everything looks good. Why don't we boot up Oregon Trail? Since I happen to live in Oregon, close to the end of the Oregon Trail, in fact, the garbage dump. <laughs> this is pretty funny. If I take stuff to the garbage dump, you get off the freeway and there's a sign that says, End of the Oregon Trail, that way. And it's also the way to the garbage dump. <laughs> it's down in Oregon City, which is just uh, south of Portland here. So here's Oregon Trail by Mech. We're gonna travel the trail and we're gonna be a banker from Boston. Let's see if lowercase works. What is the name of the wagon leader? Apple, that lowercase does work, sweet. Commodore. And we have Atari. IBM PC, and um, well, when this thing came out, well, oh, K-Pro, there we go. <laughs> are these names correct? Yes, they are. Yep, going back to 1848, nice. So obviously this thing is working. It is fully compatible with Apple II software, which is awesome, and seems like this computer is now fully operational and fully functional. Anyhow, that's gonna be it for part two on the Franklin Ace 1200. I thought this video was gonna be a little bit faster and I wouldn't struggle with the disk drives as much as I did. So that means that I'm leaving off this video without having tried out these peripheral cards that were inside the machine, like this multi IO parallel serial card that was in there. I wanna see if this thing works with ADT Pro. That way, if you're buying one of these and this is the card you get in there, you can know if that card's gonna work or you're gonna to need to get yourself an Apple Super Serial Card. In addition, there was the cool 80 column card from Franklin in there, which obviously, well, I think is gonna be a Videx clone. And it looks like it has auto switching capability between 40 and 80 columns. So I wanna test that out, make sure that works. And lastly, we have this. This is the CPM card that was in this machine. This is also bundled with this computer to give it more features, to make it more appealing than an Apple II computer. This is a PCPI CPM clone, it looks like to me. 64K of RAM, six megahertz Z80, it should run pretty quickly. 
So in the next video, we will check those out. If you've enjoyed the repairs I've done so far on this machine, like the keyboard and the floppy drives and the power supply, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If not, you know what to do. I would like to give a special thanks to all my patrons. Their names are scrolling off the side of the screen. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. Patrons get early access to videos, not to mention the higher tiers get behind the scenes and other cool little posts and random things that I do post sometimes. So I think that is going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.